see so many people with us this evening. We've got a very special guest with us this evening. Cassandra Lipp is the Associate Managing Editor of Writer's Digest magazine. She's been with the magazine since 2018 and has just been a, a wonderful editor with whom to work. So I'm very excited to have her here. We're gonna talk about uh, Writer's Digest, its editorial needs, how to pitch, its various departments, how much it pays, just everything freelance writers need to know if they're interested in this potential market. Let me read Cassie's bio for you real quick. Cassandra Lipp worked as a freelance writer for local publications and wrote the nonfiction book, Queen City Records, which tells the history of Cincinnati record stores before becoming managing editor of Writer's Digest in 2018. Driven by a passion for helping other writers improve their craft, she also leads writing workshops and works as a freelance book editor and consultant. Her specialties include creative nonfiction, memoir, poetry, humor, and narrative nonfiction. Cassandra enjoys writing poetry, humor, and personal essays in her spare mo and any spare moment she gets. Her work has appeared in Points and Case, Ohio's Best Emerging Poets, and elsewhere. In addition to writing, she has been a stage manager and performer uh, with Improv Cincinnati. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cassandra Lip. Cassie, we got lots to talk about tonight. If I click so on her- What do you wanna talk about first? There we go. Well, actually, what I'd like to do is um, tell us a little bit about how you came to join the staff of Writer's Digest. Um, you talked a little bit about your professional background. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit for us, the kind of writing you did, the freelance work that you did before you joined Writer's Digest? Uh, well, I took any freelance work I could get because I had just graduated college and um, like most people know, it's hard to find a job with a degree in English and journalism. I, even though I worked plenty of internships, um, it's still pretty hard. So I had some contacts with the publications I was interning for, and I just started freelancing for them, mostly local publications like our Alt Weekly and I did some, a little bit of copywriting for the, um, the university's continuing ed program, and then that's where I started teaching as well. And then one of the assignments I took on was writing a book, which was exciting. Um, a photographer was self-publishing a book of his photography, but he wanted some narrative to go with that, those photos, uh, because the book, he took photos of all the record stores in Cincinnati. There were 14, I think, at the time that I wrote it. Um, they open and close, so I don't know how many there are now. But I went to each store and I interviewed the owners and wrote their history, and that went into the book. And the, and I just kept freelancing for another year until the job I've been now, the position opened up and they said they were impressed with my work on the book and they're like, hey, we want people with more knowledge of self-publishing for Writer's Digest because we focus a lot on traditional publishing. So they like the expertise that I brought and they hired me. Were you with um, Writer's Digest before the the W the um, um, bankruptcy? Were you um, with? I, you joined? Yeah, I started on October 29th, twenty eighteen. I remember the date because it's my boyfriend's birthday. So I started on October 29th, and they filed for bankruptcy on March twelfth. <laughs> so awesome timing on your part. <laughs> not there for very long um so i sort of learned very quickly how to do run a magazine with diminishing resources and during lots of uncertainty but i think it all worked out because i'm still at the magazine today i think i've aged in dog years but <laughs> it's worked out um 
the a, a media ended up acquiring Writer's Digest. Um, you and I had talked briefly before this about some changes, wh whatever changes that uh, A Media brought to the publication. You mentioned not a lot, but there was a couple that might be of interest. Could you talk just a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so um, come August, we'll have been the, with them for a year. And well, most recently, our issue count went from eight issues a year to six issues a year. So it'll be bi-monthly. Um, and that means that the magazine's actually going to be thicker because we're adding more pages to make up for the less issue frequency. So um, we're starting to plan, plan our issues for 2021 soon. Um, we should be getting better paper on the November, December issue, which is something we've been wanting to do for a long time. Our paper's kind of thin. Um, John, have you noticed any changes? Um, there's, I noticed a couple of new columns in the magazine. Oh, yes, we have new columns. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so we added notes from the margins which is written by our old writer's digest book editor the book division sold to penguin random house but uh we got to keep the wonderful book editor so now she writes a column for us about anything book related like book proposals comp titles things like that and another editor who was also working on books a lot now he does publishing insights that column which is about um finding markets to sell your writing to and how to pitch to those editors he does a lot of research on those topics because before he was doing the writer's market book so he knows a lot about markets for writers do you anticipate any new departments in the magazine that might be appropriate for freelance contributors down the road? Or do you think things are pretty well set at this point? Well, there's always our five minute memoir, which is 650 words or fewer about um, something spe specific in your writing life. And that's one of my favorite columns to require because I just love reading all our submissions and finding out about people's writing journeys. And our Indie Lab column, which is 600 words about self-publishing, that is, it's not a set writer, it's a new writer every issue. So if anybody has expertise on self-publishing, that would be a good one to pitch to. Um, I think most of our columns are either staff written or written by, like Don used to do our conference scene, now it's Christy Stevenson. Um, but we do have um, features, you could pitch features or um, shorter features that go in our front of the book column called Inkwell. It's kind of, Inkwell is kind of a mashup of pieces. It's got our five minute memoir, a couple of features, and then a few mainstays. And there's always online too. And the great thing about online is we don't have to worry about space. We can kind of just put whatever we want on there. And online pays about $75 per accepted submission, correct? Yes, $75 for online, and then for print, we pay 50 cents a word. Um, Which I think is great, 50 I'm, cents a word, um, because when I was writing for our local Alt Weekly, I was getting paid 10 cents a word, and then the pay went down. So um, I'm happy that we're able to pay people 50 cents. 
Before we start talking about pitching and this and that, I wanted to talk just a minute about your job. Um, as managing editor, what exactly are your, your specific editorial responsibilities? Um, a little bit of everything. Um, so I'll look, I'll look through submission. I check our submissions inbox every day. So I'll do that. And I'm not the one that actually sends out the contracts, but I work with our editor in chief to say like, okay, which one should we fit in each issue? And then I'll do the first pass editing, which, um, both me and our editor in chief will do the first pass. And then I make sure our designer gets the everything she needs to design the page. And then when she's done, she sends it back to me. So I'm also the copy editor. And then I'll um, let her know any changes we have to the page. And then when it's getting close to time to send the issue to the printer. I'm also the proofreader. So I'll proof that. And um, I help, I do a little bit of online, but not a lot. I just do a writing prompt each week. Um, so, oh, I write the cover line. Basically, it, when you open the issue, I did it's my life's work. <laughs> <laughs> what now, I spend most of my life doing. Writer's Digest is celebrating its, ten, its 100th anniversary, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so it started in 1920. I think it was called Successful Writing. Um, but they changed the name to Writer's Digest pretty soon after that. Um, so our November, December issue was the 100th anniversary issue, which is exciting because not only am I working for a publication that's older than my grandparents, um, we have 100 years of archive. And I like, well, now I have to look at the archive, scan PDFs of them. But when we were in the office, I could look through all the old copies. And it's inspiring to see how writing has changed over 100 years. Well, I um, wanted to ask you, though, looking back and now forward, what role do you see Writer's Digest playing within the broader writing community? In other words, why should writers continue to read Writer's Digest? Learn how to improve your craft. I also think that the editor-in-chief and I have recently talked about wanting to write more about social issues in Writer's Digest and how you can write for change and maybe try and improve some issues that you see in the world with your writing or maybe bring attention to those issues. Um, because I think if you want your book to be remembered for decades, um, possibly centuries after you've published it, I think writing about social issues is a good way to do that. So I've been trying to think of some content that focuses on that area. And there's also um, plenty of useful tips about things. A lot of things I don't even know how to do until I'm editing the article about how to do that. Like, um, we focus on both craft and the business side of writing. So how do you write your book proposal? How do you get an agent? How do you market your book? What's the publishing process like? Um, what does your favorite author have to say about the writing process? Okay, terrific. Um, let's talk a little, well, a, a number, you mentioned Christy Stevenson, who's now writing the, um, yeah the uh, um, uh, conferencing column, and a number of other TAF uh, members have also written for you. Um, what percentage of articles would you say are authored by freelance contributors in an average issue? Hmm. That's a good question, which I don't have an answer to off the top of my head. Um, because sometimes we do have like big annual features that take up the majority of a feature well, like our 
101 best websites issue in our agent roundup, those are usually staff written. Um, and it really, it's sometimes the interview is done by a staff member, sometimes it's by a freelancer, so it really changes each issue. Okay, great. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your current editorial needs, both for features and for the smaller inkwell uh, um, items. Are there certain types of articles that you currently are in need of? or any areas of writing that you would like to see more submissions about? Well, we definitely right now need, um, in terms of freelancers, we need judges for our competition. That's important, which um, it involves a little writing because we're looking for people to read books and then write commentaries on those books for our self-published um, self-published book awards. So if anyone's interested in that, let me know at the end of the meeting. I'll be happy to talk to you. We've I've already recruited, I think, three people from this writing group, but we have room for more. And that is a paying of, gig, by the way, correct? Oh, yes, it's yeah. paying gig. You get paid $20 a book. So if you like reading and you want to get paid for it, it's a great way to break in. And we haven't gotten to plan our issue themes for the next year yet, so I can't exactly say what I want to see more of because um, I don't know how would it all fit in our new theme. Okay, true. But I definitely like to see something I've never seen before. You do like outside the box ideas. I, I know that personally because with Erica, she accepted some things that were like really off the wall and I had a lot of fun writing. So I keep telling people that want to pitch to Writer's Digest, think outside the box. Think of writing from a really different perspective. Would you agree that that's a good way? I totally agree because, well, it's a hundred year old magazine. So you think everything about writing that there is to say about writing, we may have covered it before. So that's why thinking outside of the box helps. Plus it's always nice to read about um, new trends in publishing or something that's new that you think a lot of writers might want to start doing but don't exactly know how to do it yet. Author interviews are a, a major component of Writer's Digest. Um, Obviously, there's writers like to talk to writers. What are you looking for regarding that particular area? I mean, what would make what to you editorially makes for a, a good writer interview? What kind of writers are you looking to interview? And how can freelancers kind of make that happen for you? Well, in terms of what writers do I want to interview? Anyone who I love to read. So I would start with the people that you love to read, but also we kind of have to think in terms of the timeliness of it. Like if somebody's promoting a book, that's a great time to reach out to them and ask for an interview because they're more likely to talk to you because they want to promote their book. Or maybe even a little before the book comes out, before their schedule gets flooded with interview requests from other publications. But I like to find out, not just find out about their writing process, but also ask them questions about like, how do they see their writing fitting into the world? And how, what's their, um, what's kind of their, their opinion on things that are changing? And where do they want things to go in terms of writing and art? I think our editor-in-chief, Amy Jones, does some really good interviews. So I would read her interviews as an example. And I think Simon Van Bowie's done some great interviews as well. And I like the questions that he asked. So I think those are good examples. Um, in terms of how to make it happen, um, a lot of times if it's going to be staff written, we'll just reach out to their agent or publicist 
and send the interview request. But I know, Don, you did a Susan Orlean interview, mm -hmm. and I think you had already you had it already written too. If you're just like, hey, do you want this? And we're like, of course. So, can you talk a little bit about how you got Susan Orlean? Well, to th that was a weird story though, because I I pitched Susan Orlean after reading the library book which was a, a book that affected me very, very, very deeply. The minute I finished that book, I turned to Nan, my wife, and I said, I want to interview Susan Orlean for Writer's Digest. So I reached out to Erica, said, I just finished the library book. It's awesome. I'm dying to interview Susan Orlean. And she wrote back immediately and said, if you can get her, I'll give you 2,500 words in the cover. <laughs> I remember that. And so I reached out to her through her publicist at her publishing house and heard nothing. I reached out again and I heard nothing. But luckily, Susan Orlean has a website and you can contact her through her website. So that's what I did. I reached out, explained what we wanted, who I was, the magazine, that I tried to reach her through her publicist, blah, blah, blah. And she wrote back almost immediately and said, absolutely, let's do this. And that's how the whole thing came together, literally that quickly and that easily. But I really appreciate Erica giving me that opportunity. And Susan was a remarkable interview. So much fun. Um, I'm glad that you got to do that. And that's a good point to make. Anybody that when you read the book, you're like, I'm dying to speak to them. For me, I think I want to learn to write like this person. I'm going to interview them so I can learn all their secrets. I interviewed Samantha Irby, um, who's one of my favorite writers ever i felt like i was in a dream when i was sitting in my basement talking to her on the phone one morning but i got to do it. it's in the july august issue if you're a subscriber but another thing to note um is that if you're a freelancer it kind of helps to have gotten in contact with their author or their publicist and agent and gotten a yes from them before you reach out to us and say, can I write this for you? Because um, we wouldn't want you to reach out to us beforehand and then that author maybe not get back to you because sometimes that does happen and it's disappointing. So I would say reach out to the author first before you start pitching it to publication. And if you've done author interviews before, that's even better because you can show it to their off the author and say, this is what I've done before. Because I think they're more likely to say yes if uh, they think you'd be a good interviewer. Cassie, was I correct on the word count for those kinds of features, 2,500, or was I off? Well, we added a page. I actually don't have the word count memorized. I have a sticky note next to my desk. Um, it's four text, yeah, four text pages. Um, four times eight, 3,200. Four times eight is 32, right? Yep. Uh, about 3,200. Right. That's why I'm an editor. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, about 3,200 words for a cover interview. Um, we do sometimes do two pagers, like you did an equal interview with the, comp, the graphic novelist. Wayne Van Zandt. Um, yeah, so the two, the inkwell interviews are generally about two pagers. Um, 1,300 or 1,400, those are kind of tricky because sometimes we put it onto a, um, a third page, like add a column onto another page to fill up some space. I think that's what you did with Wayne. Yeah, so I'd say maybe 1,400 is good for that. And we can always cut it down. The harder thing is adding things in and then online interviews could be any length because we're not limited by space but i think at least 1400 makes for a good interview because okay, it's got um a lot you can work with what kind of stuff. pitches are you sick and tired of receiving I'm, I'm assuming that there are ideas that you see consistently that are just unworkable what do you not want to see anymore um, well, we definitely haven't been taking any um, any pitches related to COVID-19, unless it's really something I haven't seen before. I really haven't been 
uh, excited about any of that, just because we get so many and it um, takes us so long to produce an issue that by the time it goes to print, it could be out of date. Right now we're working on a September, October issue. I did so. want to ask you how far in advance you work issue wise. Um, yeah, we're right now on September, October. Um, but the pieces are acquired even before that. So it's almost July. So we do work like a few months ahead in terms of the print date. But if you want to pitch something for a certain issue, I would start at least six months ahead. Okay, that's good to know. Of um, when it would be on newsstands. The earlier, the better. You had mentioned- um, And maybe even like pitching as much as a year ahead sometimes works because we might get um, a pitch that we think is wonderful and we're like, oh, we can fit it in this issue and the issues start filling up. So, um, that's a good way to guarantee there's going to be space for your, for your feature that you want to write. I'd like to talk just briefly again about the five minute memoir, which I think mm -hmm. is a really unique section in the, in Inkwell. Could you talk just a little bit more about what that is? Because it's really a unique animal. When you think about it, it's really more of kind, almost like a personal essay specific yes. to some aspect of your writing experience. Is, is that an accurate description? Yes, it's a flash essay because it's 650 words, so it's very short. And I like to emphasize that you said um, it's a specific experience because there's some pitches we get that um, well, in any sort of flash piece, you don't want to be cramming too much in very little words. So some people might try and put their entire writing biography in 650 words, and it sort of just reads like a resume, and it's just not as strong as it could be. So we like to see something that picks um, something very specific to your writing experience. Our most recent one. Uh, well, one that we're working on now that will be in September, October is a writer that talks about uh, that he's visually impaired and his condition sort of worsened as he was getting his MFA in New York and his journey on how writing became difficult for him because when he was typing, he was just looking at a black screen, but Eventually, a um, company reached out to him and made him um, an AI voice that sounds just like his voice. So it, he's um, able to write better because he isn't listening to an automatic Siri sounding voice when he's trying to read his work back to himself. So again, it's a very specific um, experience that's specific to him. But what I love about personal essays, and it's just personal essays in general, I feel they talk about an experience that's specific to the writer, but also really, really resonates to, with other people because they can relate to their experience. I would encourage anybody who is interested in writing for for that section to read a couple of issues worth yeah. before you pitch because like I said it really is a unique animal um, and the topics are all over the place but it's really really creative and it's and it's a really good way I think to break in I would imagine a number of contributors may have broken into the magazine through five minute memoir they did actually in my five minute memoir the one we just picked he started with a um, online guest post last year. So he wrote about rethinking writer's block as an illness. And so when I was looking through the inbox, I recognized his name and I was like, oh, he's a good writer. I know this one's going to be good. And it was. Could you talk a minute about that? What you were, you just mentioned where you found this writer? I, I wasn't familiar. Oh, he with just it. hits it in our submissions inbox. No, but before that, you said he had done a post? Yeah, he had done a guest post for us. Um, so last year, 
we didn't have the budget for online guest posts. It was normally people promoting their books would submit them on spec and we'd publish them. But now we do, we're paying $75 a post, so. Are you the um, person to pitch to that? Well, our online editor's name is Robert Brewer. I'd say he's the person to pitch. But since I check the submissions inbox, I'll forward to him anything I think that he would be interested for online. But I think pitching a specific editor does help when you're pitching anywhere because things get lost so easily in general submission inboxes. We get a lot of spam, a lot of things that have nothing to do with writing at all. Like somebody wanting to write a guest post about online casino marketing. Um, we get lots of those. And they'll even send us a bunch of pitches that have nothing to do with Writer's Digest. <laughs> and they all have weird names. So if you don't want to get lost in those, um, you send, send things to me directly or to the other, another editor you'd like to pitch to directly. And I've noticed when, when people pitch to me directly, I'm more willing to work with them to make sure their pitch gets seen by the other editors and and makes it through the proper channel because now i'm you, like they thought of me yay <laughs> now you write the the breaking in section is that correct do you do you regularly do breaking in now that section profiles debut authors writing in all genres um yeah. how do you select the authors that you profile every issue well, this is a fun one because it's my favorite column to write. I, well, first thing first, does their book look interesting? A lot of times we'll get, well, back when we were in the office, we would get art from the publishers. So I would be able to read the book first and know, is it good? I would all, um, but now we get digital art. So um, I'll be reading a PDF. So is the book good? Does it sound interesting? What's the author's background? Because um, I really like to feature authors that have an interesting background, like if they switched careers before they became an author, or um, what, I love to see what sort of things they were doing before they were an author so I can kind of be like, oh, they might have an interesting story to tell because they face some obstacles. Um, we do feature authors from all sorts of backgrounds, but I try and keep in a mix of MFA versus non-MFA um, location. Like, I don't want to feature all writers who live in New York, which there's a lot of writers that live in New York, but I want our readers to feel like it's a publication for everyone. So I make sure I feature authors from around the country or even around the globe. And I make sure there's, I always make sure there's at least one author from a small press in the issue. So we get a lot of books from the big five publishers, but I want to make sure independent publisher releases get the attention they deserve. So um, make sure those are in the mix, diversity of genres. So it's kind of um, a lot of factors go into how I actually decide how the authors fit together. Are you? Oh, and then the last thing's release date. I'm sorry. I want the book to, the last thing is release date of their book. So I make sure their book's coming out around the same time as the issue. Are you averse to new authors sending you a copy of their book in the hope that it will be profiled in the column? It sounds like you're getting most from um, publishers. Well, if they're gonna send me a copy of their book for the column, I would prefer that it's a debut book. Because sometimes people are like, oh, it's my debut novel, but I've also published two poetry collections. It has to be their first book. But I would actually prefer to be able to read it beforehand so that I know what I'm promoting. Because what if I, 
What if last year I had agreed to promote a novel called American Dirt without reading it? I want to read it so I know what I'm promoting and make sure it's something that I want to back. You used the phrase ARC a moment ago. Just for those who don't oh, know, that advanced stands for advanced copy. reading copy. Is that right? Yeah, so um, that's how publishing houses secure a lot of publicity before a book comes out, is they'll send advanced reader copies to, or galleys to publications, book bloggers, and they read it first. But a lot of it sends um, digital galleys through NetGalley, I think. Yeah, I've read some books like that. Okay, terrific. Um, now let's talk about what everybody wants to know, and that is the best way to put a proposal in front of you and get your attention. How do you like to be pitched by potential freelance contributors? And to how much information do you want in a proposal? For an article proposal, I mean. Well, if it's somebody I've never worked with before, I like to see it on spec because um, it's, um, it's kind of just, it's just kind of hard to see what the final product would look like and if their voice would fit our magazine without seeing the completed article first. Um, but if somebody's got good credentials, I'll, I'll look at, and I like their writing samples, I'll be like, okay, this is good. Do you have um, a draft you can show me? I definitely don't like to see any queries that are vague. Um, I want to be very, to tell me exactly what you're gonna write, what you want to write. Um, are there any sources you've contacted or plan to contact? What are your qualifications? Who have you written for before? Um, what sort of angles are you gonna look at this article through? Um, so a basic query letter, which we have articles on how to write query, query letters if you've ever written one, but um, I figure a lot of you probably have written many query letters before. So just send me a basic query letter and preferably it on spec. Would you, uh, one of our members asked in chat what on spec means. Could you, could you very quickly um, define that? So it's already written rather than, um, writing about something you plan to write. Which I know as a freelancer, it can be hard to submit things on spec because you're writing something without getting paid first. Um, and it's kind of a gamble because sometimes you write things and you pitch things and you don't get a response from the editor or you get a no. But if in general, if you're pitching to a publication you've never written for before, submitting on spec is the best way to do it. What is, generally speaking, what is the response time for submitted for uh, uh, queries sent to you? I know you're um, busy, 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 so. Yeah. Um, well, for things in the submission inbox, we don't respond to everything. We can't respond to everything because we get so many. And I'm not even sure some of them are real. But for things that are actual good pitches, um, it really just depends because sometimes I want to respond to somebody, but I can't because we're still planning issue themes or the other editors haven't seen it yet. But I would say if I haven't responded to you after like two or three weeks, you can send me a nudge because I, I tell Don all the time, like if I forget, like if I if you don't get a response from me, you can just assume I forgot because I'm doing a lot of other things and just send me a reminder. One of our members, uh, we had talked about the word count for edit for uh, writer interviews. Ballpark, what is the average word count for features? It depends on the features because they can be either three or four pages. And for new writers, we like to start them out in Inkwell before. So for Inkwell, I would say 1,300 words is a good word count. Um, for features, um, for a four-pager, 2,400. 
and then a little shorter. We said about 600 words a page, so maybe 1,800 for a three-pager. It sounds to me like you've really expanded the word count on a lot of sections in the magazine from previous years. Is that accurate? Um, I don't actually know because I haven't <laughs> sent you that one. That's I true. Know, um, <laughs> Sorry. I think, uh, well, my design, our designer and I a lot of times go back and forth. Like when we put um, an issue together, we'll be like, how did this come up short? And we'll have to like scramble to fill pages a lot of times. Uh, but I think I realized the problem was that we can fit 800 words per page on some page and 600 words per page on other pages. And I was mixing that up. But um, because it, it depends because there's pull quotes and photos and things like that. And that's what messes it up. That's why it varies a lot. And then sometimes we have a half page illustration. Sometimes we have a whole page illustration opening it up. And usually those things are decided while we're in the production and I'm choosing how to lay things out so that we don't have to cut anything dramatically or add to it dramatically. Okay. Now we know that Writer's Digest pays 50 cents a word. Do you pay additionally for reprints? like in the Writer's Digest yearbook or something like that? We do pay for reprints, um, but we haven't been doing them as much as we used to. So we used to reprint from Writer's Digest book, but we don't, um, well, I guess we have a deal with Penguin, so we're reprinting from the books now, but in the future, we won't be doing that anymore because we're not publishing any new books under ourselves. Um, and then we used to have like newsstand only issues where we would reprint articles from the past year, but we haven't been doing those in the past, not since I've been there. So for about two years, we haven't been doing the special issues, but when we do those, we do pay for the reprint. Okay, great. Unless it's staff written. Can you talk just a little bit about the kinds of articles that Robert Brewer, I know that Robert Brewer is the editor of the website, mm -hmm. but can you talk a little bit about the kinds of articles that tr that commonly run on the D Writer's Digest website? Yeah, so a lot of them are staff written. Uh, most of them are written by Robert. He does a lot of grammar posts, um, like, canceled with one L versus canceled with two L's. It seems kind of simple, but it's a lot of things that people are going to be searching on to Google. Um, grammar and punctuation wise, he'll cover. We do some reprints from the magazine, like from our print magazine, we'll then put it online. We'll do things from our archives. Um, because we have 100 years of archives, we'll find old things to put online, some author interviews, um, a lot of um, guest posts by people promoting their books. So they'll find any area of expertise that they're, so if they wrote a historical fiction novel, they might be like, how do you do research for historical fiction? Something like that. So a lot of the, our online articles are shorter and, but as with the print, it's something very specific and a lot of practical advice that writers can use. Awesome. Cassie, you've been wonderful this evening. I'd like to conclude our talk before we go to questions by asking you, what advice would you offer to writers in general regarding writing and publishing? What what do you see as the key to continued success for freelance writers? Um, well, this is something actually that one of my breaking in authors said. She said she jokes that she was only able to get published because she was too stubborn and foolish to give up. And I think that's great advice because I, mean, I get rejection letters all the time because um, I write freelance, try and write freelance pieces on my own. And I try not to get discouraged by the rejection letters because I know 
um, it's hard. It's very competitive. So I think you should not get discouraged because success isn't happening right away. You should just keep trying. But um, also think what mistakes am I making that I could get better. Um, that definitely helps land more pitches in magazines. And I think connecting with the editors and really researching a publication before you pitch to them is good because there's some pitches we get and I can tell they haven't even read the magazine. Um, so reading the publications you want to pitch to, researching the editors and what they're interested in and pitching directly to them, I think um, are good ways to increase your chances of success. Awesome. I think some of our members have some questions for you. If you can give us just a couple more minutes, Cassie. Maya, you want to do that? I see the chat right here. Is it easier for you? Um, yes, I did see a question from Liz. So I'm going to see if I can find her. Or if Liz, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Liz. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on your, I have, I, as soon as you started talking about author interviews, I thought of like four different authors I'd love to interview, <laughs> but I don't know if they would, they'd be more likely to say yes if I had a reasonably good sense of whether they would be able to be featured or not. Would there, would, would it be okay to just like run the name by you? I know you're super busy, so I don't know. Yeah, if that... I could, um, I could tell you if we'd feature them before or not, or if we're familiar with their work and we're like, yes, we love them, please do it. So that could be a good idea. Okay, thank you so much. And if they, um, even if I haven't heard of them before, I'll always look them up and I'll see how they might fit into um, things we've been wanting to do or different themes. So I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Jesse, can we share your email address for those who might be interested in becoming judges for the writing contest? Yes, you can type it into the chat. So then, or I can type it into the chat. Okay. Uh, just so no one mishears me. It's C-L-I-P-P -P at aimmedia.com, correct? Yes. I'm making sure I type it correctly. <laughs> yeah. So that's my email. Um, I'm reviewing all the judge applications and um, I'll look at pitches too. And I always share them with the other editors and see what they think. Oh, one thing I forgot, we have a screenwriting magazine. So if any of you are screenwriters, I can forward your pitches to our screenwriting editor as well. So um, I just wanted to add that there because <laughs> I know he needed some pitches. Well, we do have some people in our group that are aspiring screenwriters, so I'm really glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Maya, who else do we have with a question? Um, I know Lois had a question. So Lois, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, um, if we're sending an article on spec, do you want it as an attachment or in the body of an email or just a regular cover letter or how do you want it? Uh, I actually think both works. If you um, send it as an attachment and then after your signature, paste it after your pitch. Because um, sometimes, sometimes people send it just in the email, but I want to see what the word count is. And that just saves me from having to copy and paste it in a Word document and see like, how, how long is this? Oh, OK. So I think sometimes um, editors, they won't take things with attachments because they're worried about uh, getting a virus. But I like to see it as both. But I would be careful when you're pitching other editors whether or not they want attachment. Okay, and then, but the email itself, is that just kind of like a cover letter? Yeah, pretty much. 
um, tells me who you are and what your qualifications are and what you want to write about. Okay, thank you. Question. Um, someone had a question about online pitches. Oh, that wasn't me. Okay. Oh, uh, Allison has a question about online pitches. Hi, yes. Um, do you generally um, have writers pitching um, online directly or is it something that you pass along um, that you've been pitched that you think would be better for the um, for the online version? Um, yeah, it's generally something that somebody pitched as a general pitch, and I just think it would work better for online, so then I forward it to Robert. Okay. Thank yeah, you. if it's more, um, if we think it'll be out of date by the time it goes to print, that's a pretty good indicator that it would be better for online. Right, but would you, um, if it's something that um, we think would be online, um, preferably online, do should we pitch um, Robert Brewer directly or go for you first? Um, it doesn't matter, I think, because uh, when I get anything, basically when we get anything that we think should go to the other person, we forward it to them. Okay. But if I'm copied on it, um, then I can make sure he uh, he gets it. Okay. All right. Like thank if you. he forgets about it, but I'm copied on it, I can be like, "Hey, Robert, did you look at this?" Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Nancy, um, who also has a question about pitches. Do all the pitches go to that one email address you typed in? Um, most of the pitches go to, um, I'll type it in the inbox, it's wbsubmissions at amedia.com. It's, uh, it's printed in the magazine, it's like a general submissions inbox, and we get so many sorts of things in the submissions inbox. We get uh, either like customer service questions for subscription fulfillment, a lot of spam, a lot of press releases. Um, so um, you can pitch to there and I'll find it, but a lot of times I tell people to pitch me directly just to make sure I see it and it doesn't get lost. And can we also can we mention put... we're TAF members? Does that yes. help to remind um, if, you? <laughs> if you're connected with somebody that the editor works with, you should always mention that. Like oh. when somebody <laughs> says that, they're friends with John. I'm like, okay, John wouldn't have sent, given this person my email if he didn't trust them. So that's why it helps to mention that you have a shared connection. And I'll type this. Okay, um, a couple more questions here. Um, Frank has a question. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Cassie, for um, talking to us. I, I also started out in the early 90s writing for an alternative weekly paper <laughs> that happily is still alive. But, oh, you know, yay! No, yay. Especially um, now. Yeah. Because our local alt weekly, all the staff is furloughed right yeah. now. Not but, surprising in this environment. But yeah, yeah, so I've, I've been. Survived. Yeah, so I've been. Uh, uh, selling articles and features and op-eds to newspapers and magazines like Fine Gardening and Boys Life and uh, Hobby Farm Magazine, things like that. And I've been getting a lot of traction in writing columns. Right now, I am down to having only three columns in mid-size magazines. Only? Yes. Yes, which I was not expecting this to work out that way. My first column, the editor asked me if I wanted to do a column. And so when I learned, you know, how they worked, I was able to like uh, multiply that. And so I'm wondering if you think Writer's Digest readers would be interested in a feature, uh, how to get your first column, the care and feeding of your editor when you have a column, you know, what readers are looking for, can you boost your income by providing photography, all the, you know, the nuts and bolts. Yeah, I think, about. I think that would be interesting. So you should okay. definitely pitch that to me. 
Okay. Because I will do that. a lot of times, like, is that something I want to know how to do? Yes. I want to commission this article so I can learn how to okay. do it. Okay. All right. Good. And I'll mention I know a guy named Don. Just, you know, yeah. in case that, in case that <laughs> yeah. helps, you know. It definitely helps because Don's one of my favorite contributors. Okay. Yeah, right. And your text in the mail, that. Cassie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. This has been very helpful. Oh, no problem. Okay. Uh, Mandy has a question. Thank you, Maya. Um, hey, Cassie, thank you so much for being here. Can my computer is not great. Um, I was asking about the five minute memoir. I know that essays are almost always accepted only on spec. So is that true for the five minute memoir as well? Yeah, because when we look at the way we choose our five minute memoir is not all the time, but a lot of times we have a few, like three to five really strong submissions and we're having to choose between them. And it's just easier if we have the completed piece. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Drew has a question. Yeah, Cassie, thank you again for being here. Um, I'm an independent publisher. I help uh, writers who are not attached to one of the big companies get their books out. I'm wondering if there's an interest in, in, in an article that talks about how to work with an independent publisher. Um, I think that what we did just do an issue on independent presses, our April 2020 issue. Um, so I think we would be interested in it, but it, we might have to give it some time uh, just to make sure it wouldn't be too similar to what we've recently published. Because a lot of times, um, sometimes we do turn down a pitch, even though it's really good, it might be too similar to something we've recently published or will publish in the future. Thank you. I think we already answered Hannah's question, but I did want to check in with Hannah. I know um, Hannah was asking um, about putting TAP in the subject line of a, a pitch to you. Um, Hannah, did you have any other questions or? Not at this time. I have a few things percolating in my brain for her for later. <laughs> okay. But the subject line should usually yes. be pitch and then like a general idea of what your pitch is, like pitch, interview with Samantha Irby, something like that. Because mm -hmm. okay. I just reminded, because I'd gone to London twice as a kid and I'm dyslexic. So now I have this English spelling mixed in with American that's dyslexified. <laughs> it makes life interesting. <laughs> well, I like the British spelling of some words better. Yes, like I think sometimes things look better. I don't like, Towards, but I like canceled with two L's. Yes. And it does have weird preferences like that with words and punctuation. Yes. Yes. I think we have one more question from Sue. Thank you. Um, I have to admit that I don't read Writer's Digest very often. I know Don's always told me to do that and I haven't. Um, I've noticed particularly with young kids, they're reading less and less. Um, I'm just wondering if Reader's, Writer's Digest is doing any kind of uh, crossover maybe into videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That um, that's actually something I've been planning on doing, but we just don't have the staff for right now because um, our editor-in-chief um, went on to um, pursue writing full-time back in March and our senior editor was promoted to editor-in-chief but we still have her position vacant so once we have more staff I've been wanting to do it. My boyfriend's actually a YouTuber full-time. He has half a million subscribers and was able to make that his career so I know a lot about digital video production and I've been trying to make that happen. So it's, it's something I've been advocating for because I know a lot about. Any other questions for Cassie? Anybody? Yes. Can I, Denise? Yeah. Denise? Yes. Hi, Cassie. Um, I'm a literary attorney for many, many years. And um, I 
I try to reduce things to very comprehensible <laughs> concepts when it comes to legal. Um, and I used to write for Sisters in Crime. I did a column for them for some time, quite a while ago. Um, so is Writer's Digest, because I very, I get it, the magazine, I've gotten it for years, but I very seldom see articles by attorneys. Is there any interest in having articles about how authors can better deal with copyright and contracts? I think there's definitely an interest in that. We did do uh, a feature by an attorney last year about audiobook publishing, audiobook rights, and yeah. audiobook and film and TV rights. And I think lawyers who have a specialization in uh, things related to books are great people to be writing for us because we're looking for people with that expertise and who can also break it down into something comprehensible yeah yeah okay good thank you cassie everybody wants to know what your boyfriend does on youtube yeah. <laughs> oh it's funny um he does gaming list videos he's downstairs finishing his next video now so he'll like find things that so like video games have editors sort of they have developers and he'll find things that de the developers left in there that wasn't supposed to be in there and he'll make a list of like the 10 creepiest endings that were never meant to be found <laughs> <laughs> things like that i help with i'm not a gamer so it's um I might not be the best person to describe it, but since I'm his co-producer, I know a lot about the video production, and I've been wanting to do similar things with books, like five creepiest books I read in middle school. That's for my, I've been wanting to start my own personal YouTube channel for things like that. <laughs> but I think for our Writer's Digest YouTube, I would maybe want to bring authors on there and talk about everything you wanted to know about writing, but in a video form. I hope you get to do that, Cassie. I do too, because be awesome. I see a lot of magazines, um, like Wired, that's a magazine, and they do a popular video series on autofill interviews. I don't know if you're familiar with that video series, but it's pretty popular. All righty, uh, last chance for final questions for Cassie, anybody? All right, Cassie, thank you. By the way, you were the guest for the most highly attended TAF meeting in the organization's history. Ooh. Congratulations. I'll put that on my resume. <laughs> so many. Uh, oh, I thought of one thing I forgot to say. Oh. If, if you send a pitch, don't address it as dear sir. <laughs> I will not look at it. That's funny. <laughs> So now you know, everybody, do not do that. Cassie, thank you so very, very much for your time today. The information you've given us is absolutely wonderful. And I know you're going to be receiving a number of really good pitches from TAF members over the next couple of weeks. With, I think it's good timing because once we plan our issue themes, we're going to be looking for things to fit those. Once you get that together, um, if you like, if you send that to me, I'll share that with our membership. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Because I would have to share it with you anyway, so you can pitch to us. Awesome. All right. You're free to hang with us for a couple more minutes if you like. We're just one of the aspects of the, our group is at the end of our meetings, we go around and we share good news, sales, um, anything good we have to report, somebody landed an interview, whatever it might be. Before we get to that, though, um, as you know, Maya Spikes was running Zoom for us this evening. Um, Maya and Karen um, and Rita Lewis have been our, our Zoom moderators over the last several events. We are looking to expand our Zoom moderators. And so Karen and um, Rita are going to be doing a Zoom tutorial um, shortly. And we're looking for people who would be interested in serving the organization by signing on to be Zoom moderators. So when I send that information out, if you're interested, shoot me an email. Me. We'll put you on the list. <laughs> I'm sorry? Karen, do you have the date in front of you for that that you were looking at? I 
don't see her on here, Don. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm right. looking for her. I'm going to unmute Karen. Here we go. She's leaving. Great place to unmute. There you go. There you I'm go. sorry, Karen. Did you hear my question? About Monday evening. We were talking about this coming Monday, the okay. 20, 29th, I think it is. At 7 o'clock? At like 7 o'clock. Okay, not going to be too people. long. Or I don't nice think it'll be long. I think we're going to, you know, maybe a half hour and that's it. So okay. it should be easy enough, give people a chance, give them some instruction, give you a chance to try playing around with some of the controls to see what's different from when you're a participant. And it's pretty straightforward. How do we get the invitations? I'll send it out. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send it out with, with Karen. Um, and also, I wanted to remind everybody that our TAF talk with award-winning journalist Mark Bowden is scheduled for Tuesday, July 14th. Um, that we're opening it at 7 o'clock, and the interview will begin at 7.30, but I'll be sending more out about that later as well. So anyway, I want to know, does anybody have any, any good news to share? Any sales? Anything to brag about? Allison, I see your hand up. <laughs> yes. Um, I, um, I sold... Um, a piece to Boys Life uh, two weeks ago, and um, it's my second piece for them. Um, another listicle, so I'm really happy about that. And I got a really, really quick response too, which was like, yes, I <laughs> loved it. And I'm doing a piece on spec for a certain magazine as well. So um, yeah, so two, um, two yeses sort of <laughs> right. in one week. <laughs> you needed after that. A dry, after a really long dry spell. So. <laughs> Congratulations. It was, it was very sweet. <laughs> Frank, you have some good news to share? Hold on, Frank. You're on mute. Red, You're on mute. You need to take a mute off. On the there we go. Computer. I'm sorry, Frank. Yeah, my maybe my computer is defective. But so after plowing through a severe case of manuscript fatigue, I finally finished the um, manuscript for my mushroom book, which is called Shroomtopia: How to Forage Mushrooms Without Dying. So I think that's a selling point. <laughs> So that'll come out the summer of next year. You got to come to my house, Frank, and harvest my front yard. I, I would love to do that, yes. <laughs> Keep me from poisoning myself. Yeah, try not to do that. <laughs> Any other good news? Anybody? Um, Joel, had, I think, had some good news. If yeah, I, I went ahead and said this on, on the uh, listserv, but I sold a short article on Shangri-La and how close Shangri-La is to us. It's a little further from Cincinnati, but um, they ran that as their, their end page in the latest issue. But the main thing I really liked was the editor, uh, Anne Monique, was very gracious about paying me fully for an article I'd written. Uh, I'd written an article on the most heavily armed front yard in America, which belonged to Josephus Daniels when he was uh, Secretary of the Navy. You can't have a 3.5 millim uh, inch cannon in your yard unless you're a naval installation. And uh, then uh, they accepted it several months ago. And then the morning I woke up and looked at the front page of the paper where they were taking down Josephus Daniel's statue, I said to my wife, well, I guess they're not going to run that article after all. And uh, Sure enough, about a day later, uh, Anne Monique wrote me and said, you know, given circumstances, they weren't going to run anything uh, about him uh, because it had nothing to do with the sleazier aspects of his life. And uh, anyway, I was very pleased, though. She said that she would go ahead and, and pay, pay what she'd agreed because I put a good deal of, of time and effort into it. So I just say shout out for... Uh, Walter Magazine. That is a good editor. Glad to hear that. Yep. I'm Anybody all in favor else? of her. <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, Mandy? 
Hey, everybody. Um, well, I'm, this might be my last will and testament because I am writing a city guide for um, Midtown Magazine, and I'm supposed to include some of the best neighborhoods, and I've already decided that Lakemont is going to go right in there with, North, Lakemont is where I live, it's going to go right in there with like North Hills as though it's a similar neighborhood, and I have a feeling that I'm going to get run out on rails, so um, <laughs> That's coming up, but I'm going to try and be brave and uh, and put some lesser lesser mentioned neighborhoods in there. But that'll be fun, and um, and I get to interview. So I think Liz knows her. I don't know if Liz is still on here, but um, I get to interview a friend of ours, Katie Gardner, who is a who is an author who's awesome, and she's going to be in the candid conversation of an upcoming issue of Midtown Magazine too. So um, so I'm doing some fun things for them. That's awesome. Good, good times. I'm glad you're still writing. I am too. Terry Bogus or B Bogus? I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Terry. That's okay. It's Bogus. So <laughs> it gets pronounced many different ways. Our uh, family reunion t shirt had about 38 different ways to misspell Bogus. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I've sold an article to Wildlife in North Carolina Magazine on the National Archery in the Schools program, which might surprise some people because kids have bows and arrows in school class time. Wow. And uh, it's uh, actually pretty popular nationally and uh, it was a good story. I reported it in February just before COVID shut down everything. So I had to track people down outside of schools and, and uh, get it done. So it is, uh, accepted and I'm awaiting proofs right now. Awesome. Next time we get together, I hope you can hold it up and show us what it looks like. It will be out in uh, September, but if I have the proofs, I'll show them next time. Awesome. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Thank you. Arlene, can you give the group a very, very quick update on the COVID anthology? Is Arlene still with us? She may have left. Yeah, I'm not seeing her. Okay. Um, what I can tell you all is that we ended up having a weird situation with uh, publishing through Amazon in that the anthology was initially rejected from Amazon for weird reasons that were not exactly um, um, clearly explained. But apparently the Amazon is working very hard to make sure that they don't publish misinformation about COVID. So having COVID-19 even in the title of the anthology flagged the book. So bottom line is that Arlene is going to have to go back, I'm sure she's working on this right now, to redo the cover, redo um, the title, you're going back and forth with a number of different titles, then she's going to redo what has to be done and resubmit the book and hopefully it will be accepted at that point. So that's where we are right now. Um, and uh, I'll talk to Arlene soon and if there's any updates on that, then I'll, I'll update everybody as well. So, um, Drew? Um, I got with a bunch of businessmen and put an anthology together about how to thrive through the storm, how to take your, what to do with your business during this period of time. And um, Elizabeth, in fact, uh, put in an article uh, about what it was like to go through some other uh, interesting experiences as, as, as a um, flight attendant. The uh, proceeds from the book are gonna go to the Food Bank for the Central and Eastern North Carolina. And we've already collected over $500 for that. So Awesome. I'm very excited with that. Anybody that might be interested, I'm also thinking about doing a volume two, just get in touch with me. If you want to write an article that has to do with, <clears throat> from your experience, what, what kind of uh, advice you have for other business people. Terrific. Elizabeth Caldwell, I saw your hand up. Did you have something to talk about? Hold on, Elizabeth. Let me oh, I was, I was just oh. telling Drew to, t to tell about his book. I oh, okay. <laughs> I was one of the participants in his book, Thriving Beyond the Storm. Oh, this, great. It, it turned out to be a really, really nice adventure. Oh, terrific. And Allison, I think you had another piece of uh, good news to share. 
Yeah, this is not writing um, related. This is my daughter. So this is so <laughs> the dinosaur <laughs> boss. <laughs> um, I am. Um, I finally got my um, interview for my citizenship. So um, I won't. Oh, excuse me. I won't be illegal anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or sort of in limbo, whatever I am right now, <laughs> it's like not quite legal. <laughs> I hope everything goes smooth. That's for July, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's for July. <laughs> it's always good to be legally in the country, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope everything goes smoothly. Where do you yeah, find you do it? I just hope they don't cancel it again. Just really? Before, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like they did last time. <laughs> it's great news. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Any as we wind down, anything else to share? Oh, um, I see Lois. Lois? Raising her hand. Yeah. Um uh Michelle Leathers, who attends has been regularly attending the TAF conferences, <clears throat> just contacted me that she has a new she has her first book out. It's called Shadow Copy Exit Darkness. It's a YA paranormal adventure. But anyway, I I tried to get her in on this meeting, but I guess her membership has lapsed. So what's the person's name? Michelle Leathers. I don't think she's a member. Yeah, I don't I think her membership has lapsed. Please encourage her to renew though. We'd love to have her back. Yeah, I told her she needs to get on here and, and uh, talk to everybody, but I just told her this is her first book, and but she's already finished three others, so she's really doing well. Awesome. That's terrific. She might be a good one to feature with the new, you know, their debut, debut, debut author. Yeah. Their debut author, although she is uh, publishing it herself. Interesting. It's worth reaching out, that's for sure. You or did she just want traditionally published people? Uh, that could be. That could be. I don't think so. I think she said self-published. She said small press, but she didn't say self-published. Mm -hmm. They may, I think they would be inundated with self-published books if they decided to go that route. But I'll check, and, and if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll send out a note. Um, anybody else? We good? Um, Hada, I think, had some... I did German something. I've been plodding along on my suspense thriller mystery book. <laughs> and I've hit my first big crime scene. It's kind of stopped me up short. But thank God years ago, speaking of sisters in crime, we had Lee Laughlin come and speak. He started off as an officer and built his way on up into Homeland Security and does trainings all over the country. And he's the one that does the Writers Police Academy every year. And thank God I have, I've been um, on his blog for a long time and have a couple of his books, helping a lot, <laughs> really making that process a lot easier. That's great. What's awesome. his name? Sorry? What's his name? Lee Laughlin. L-O-F-L-A-N-D. Yes. Yeah, I've written about his uh, his um, writer's boot camps. They're pretty impressive. Yeah, he's really great, and he's very approachable. Okay. Um, I think it's time to, to wind up. Um, again, I thought this was an awesome meeting. Thank all of you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a lot out of Cassie's presentation. Um, if you have any questions that I, uh, regarding Writer's Digest that I might be able to help with, just shoot me a note. Um, Devon at mindspring.com and if I can help I certainly will. Um, again just a reminder about Monday's uh, tutorial for Zoom and the TAF talk with Mark Bowden on July 14th. It's going to be great fun. So thank you all for attending tonight. I hope everything stays safe, stay well, keep writing, thank and you. we'll convene later. You have a good one. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.